All right, thanks, Mike, very, <coughs> very much for that kind introduction. It's an honor to be here speaking in this session. It's my brief conflict of interest disclosure slide. Okay, so my lab focuses on targeted genome editing for therapeutics. So we think about this as technology to make efficient targeted changes to the genomes of living cells. And so more recently, we've been a bit more picky about this definition. And so ideally, we'd like to do this without making any other undesired changes to the genome. So since this is the first talk of the session, I'm going to give you a broad overview of the topic. And so <clears throat> genome editing is really enabled by cellular repair for nucleus-induced double-stranded breaks. These breaks are typically repaired by one of two competing DNA repair pathways. This can either be non-homologous end joining, where typically it's an error-prone <coughs> pathway where you can get variable length insertions or deletions that can be used to introduce so-called gene knockouts. Or you have the precise homology-directed repair pathway, where in the presence of a user-supplied donor template, you can mediate precise sequence modification. So this is often used for gene correction. There's a number of different classes of engineered nucleases. These include uh, meganucleases, zinc finger nucleases, talons, as well as more recently the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And so one of the really exciting aspects about CRISPR-Cas9 that we all know about is that it really simplifies genome editing. And so very briefly, this is a two-component complex where you have Cas9 protein that can be complexed with a short guide RNA sequence. And so in the case of S. pyogenes Cas9, um, the Cas9 RMP complex can recognize a 20 base pair target site adjacent to an NGG protospacer adjacent motif. And so upon recognizing its target, Cas9 can introduce a targeted double stranded break. So at St. Jude, I just recently started my lab in the Department of Hematology, and so we're thinking a lot about hemoglobinopathies, in particular sickle cell disease. And so in collaboration with the lab of uh, Mitch Weiss, been thinking about correcting sickle cell mutations or strategies for basically therapeutically treating sickle cell disease. And so the overall idea is simply that you might take um, hematopoietic stem cells from a patient, that you might modify these cells by gene editing and then introduce these modified cells back into the patient. So I'm not going to go into the specifics of this strategy, but I'll point you to the talk of John Yves Mateus, um, it's oral abstract 744 on Saturday. So I think one aspect of gene editing for therapeutics is that for most of these strategies, you're exposing hundreds of millions to billions of cells in a single therapeutic dose. And so it's important to realize that even cells with low frequency off-target mutations might be relevant if they confer a selective growth advantage. And so this is really important to address, particularly for therapeutic applications. I think it's important that we learn the lessons of earlier gene therapy trials. And so to be more explicit in the context of SCID-X1 trials, gamma retroviral gene vectors uh, resulted in T-cell leukemia-like disease in several young patients. And so what they found was that vector integrations found near the ALMO2 proto-oncogene were really associated with uncontrolled T-cell clonal proliferation. So the difference between gene therapy approaches um, and gene editing is that unlike gene therapy, there's really no vector integrations that are easy to track in gene editing. And so really defining where the off-targets might occur for gene editing really can enable critical safety monitoring. So methods for defining off-targets as comprehensively as possible might enable you to detect in an early fashion the clonal expansion of cells harboring unwant unwanted edits. And so I think a question that comes up a lot is that, okay, you might be able to generate these long lists of off-targets, but what do they mean? We really, our capacity to interpret the information in the human genome um, is, is very small compared to our ability to basically sequence that information. And so a lot of these targets might occur in intergenic regions of the genome. We might not be able to interpret these, <coughs> these uh, off targets. And so I think I would argue that it's really important to define their locations even if we can't interpret their function because being able to know where they are would enable us to monitor them over. So some of the first uh, efforts for finding off targets involve basically computational prediction. And so the idea is that you can predict sites that are similar to the intended target sites based on computational algorithms 
such as uh, sequence similarity and other parameters, it's very easy to do. And so in some of the early studies, uh, for example, conducted in uh, Keith's lab and others, we found that there's the potential for high frequency CRISPR-Cas9 off targets. Um, so we looked at a number of different nucleases and found high frequency off targets in a number of different cell lines. And so we can see off targets, sometimes with frequencies higher than the on target site um, with up to five mismatches. So I like to highlight the limitations of these studies with a cartoon called the streetlight effect. And so you have a policewoman that comes up to a man. She asks him what he's doing and he says, I'm trying to find my keys. And so she asks, is this where you lost them? He says, no, I think it was two blocks over. So then she says, then why are you looking for them here? And he says, the light is so much better here. And it's kind of a ridiculous cartoon, but I think it's very human to try to look where the light is better. And so I think this is a very classic case of observational bias. Um, and so to kind of extend this analogy, if you imagine the genome is a parking lot, and so these lights are basically shining on uh, spots where you're trying to look for off-target activity, and the keys represent off-targets. And so I think the obvious limitations of these types of targeted sequencing approaches are that you'll never find sites where you're not looking. So one obvious approach that a lot of people think about when you're think, trying to look for the genome-wide activity of engineered nucleases is why don't we just do whole genome sequencing? And so the answer to that is that even with today's next-gen sequencing technology, it's really not practical to sequence large numbers of genomes. You can get whole genome sequence with coverage of, let's say, 50x, but if you're trying to interrogate millions or billions of genomes, it's simply not practical even today to do that. And so the significant limitation is that these types of approaches will miss off-target effects with low frequency. So you can really only do this in clones, not in cell populations. There have been a number of methods now for defining specificity. Um, the IDLV capture method was one of the original methods, HTGTS, BLESS, GuideSeq, DigenomeSeq, SiteSeq, and CircleSeq. And so I'm going to tell you today about two methods that I developed I help lead the development of. So the first of these is a cell-based method. It's called genome-wide unbiased identification of double-stranded breaks enabled by sequencing or GuideSeq. And so GuideSeq is based on the principle of optimized tag integration, the sites of nucleus-induced double-stranded breaks. The idea is that we can basically end protect the tag to optimize its integration. Um, and so we're able to capture double-stranded breaks by presumably non-homologous end-joining into the sites of nucleus-induced double-stranded breaks. And so from there, we can perform a tag-specific amplification with the goal of basically retrieving the genomic sequence that surrounds the tag. Um, we can map these areas of the genome to find double-stranded breaks. And so some of the advantages of this method are that it's fairly unquantitative and unbiased, but some disadvantages are that it does require transfection of the small DNA tag, which you can't do necessarily in all cells. So here's an example of GuideSeq genome-wide off-target profiles. I'm showing you one for one of the first genes we looked at, a gene, a guide RNA targeted towards EMX1. You, you can see that um, I have, I've highlighted the on-target site in green and off-target sites are in red. So if you then count up the number of off-targets, you can produce a histogram over here. And so here are the first 10 guide RNAs that we looked at by GuideSeq, and so you can see that there's a widely varying number of off-targets um, found by GuideSeq for this method, including all known off-targets at that time. So as I mentioned, um, one of the advantages of GuideSeq is that it is a fairly quantitative method. So tag integrations are fairly proportional to mutagenesis frequency. Here I'm showing you GuideSeq recount on the y-axis with uh, indel frequency on the x-axis. And so we see pretty good correlations um, between this. But I think what this also means is that while the advantage is that it's fairly quantitative, it means that if you wanted to scale the method to make it more sensitive, that you'll need to basically linearly scale the method. It means that you'll need to both increase the number of input genomes as well as sequencing. And so you can imagine that if you want to achieve orders of magnitude increases in sensitivity, it's going to be very hard to do with GuideSeq. And so that motivated us to think about in vitro genome-wide off-target discovery methods. 
And so there's some potential advantages of these methods over cell-based methods. And I want to mention by in vitro, I mean based on purified protein, RNA, and DNA. And so some potential advantages are that it's not dependent on transfection or transduction of cells, that it's not dependent on DNA repair, which means that you can more precisely map um, sites of nucleus-induced breaks, that there's the potential for really high sensitivity because you can increase the protein to DNA ratio, that's potentially very easy to automate and scale. So the first of these methods, um, of in vitro methods that has been demonstrated was from the lab of Jinsu Kim. So this is a method called digested genome sequencing. And so the idea of this method is actually quite simple. Um, basically, you take uh, genomic DNA, you cut it with Cas9, you shear it, and you add sequencing adapters, and then you perform whole genome sequencing and mapping. And so when you do that, the expectation is that you'll have some fragments that have very uniform ends. This is because they've been cut with Cas9 once you map them to the genome, and so you can look for them uh, in the context of whole genome sequencing. So the advantage is that it's simple. It's a PCR-free method. But some of the disadvantages are that you're basically performing whole genome sequencing to look for these small spots that have been cut by Cas9. And so you can imagine that the background for these types of methods might be quite high. You can also imagine that simply by chance you might have some reads that have the same ends. And so it might be hard to distinguish this from sites that have been really cleaved by the nucleus. And so I think the way to think about digenome seq is that you're basically in a sea of double-stranded breaks. You're looking for new double-stranded breaks in, um, cut by Cas9. And so this is kind of the challenge. And so we kind of thought of this as um, very similar to um, the idea of like, let's say you're meeting a friend in the park or something. In the crowd of people, how do you really find someone? How do you, how do you stand out from a crowd? And so the idea really is that you, all you need to do is you need to be different. And so we're really thinking about approaches where how can we make um, Cas9 cleave genomic DNA molecules different? And so the idea was by basically manipulating DNA topology. We really wanted to basically create a population of DNA molecules that have very few available ends, such that when you cut the DNA, you'd be able to produce new ends that could be easily detected. And so we call this method circularization for in vitro reporting of cleavage effects by sequencing or sickle seq. And so the principle is very simple. It's basically selective sequencing of Cas9 cleaved genomic DNA. Uh, we do this by we shear the genomic DNA. And then the goal is to create a population of circularized genomic DNA in molecules. We uh, create new, novel molecular biology to do this, which I'll show you um, the next slide. But the main idea, again, is that you circularize the DNA, you treat with an exonuclease to remove excess linear DNA, and now you have a population of highly purified molecules that have very few free ends. You can then treat this population of circles with Cas9. Cas9 will linearize these circles, and so anywhere where it has activity, you'll have linear DNA fragments to which you can ligate adapters and perform high throughput sequencing. And so some of the advantages of this method are that it eliminates the background that you might see with digenome seq, as I'll show you further on. To show you some more details of the circularization strategy, it's really an adaptation of standard next generation sequencing methods. We're ligating a uracil containing stem loop adapter to shear genomic DNA. We're using exonuclease treatment to get rid of any partially ligated DNA. And then we're using user enzyme T4P and K to open up those stem loops, creating essentially four base pair palindromic overhangs as you might have with a typical restriction enzyme, but not limited by the sequence specificity of any particular restriction enzyme. And so this is a, a way of basically circularizing the DNA. And so we now can perform a standard intramolecular ligation to circularize the DNA and perform exonuclease treatment to select for circles over linear DNA. Okay, so here I'm showing you um, some data where we did a comparison um, at the target site for HVB for um, digenome seq versus circle seq. I'm showing you coverage plots over here um, with digenome seq on the left, circle seq on the right, nuclease on the top, and control on the bottom. And so what you can see is that in comparison to digenome seq, circle seq has much higher um, read coverage at this on target site. And I'll note that we're doing this using essentially 100-fold less reads. 
And so I think this is one of the um, aspects of CircleSeq I think that'll be helpful for regular labs so that you can run this on a standard MySeq type run. So we looked at the technical reproducibility of CircleSeq. So here I'm showing you CircleSeq recounts uh, between two different experiments for the same guide RNA. And so we found pretty high technical reproducibility in um, these experiments. Showing you one of the first examples of CircleSeq genome-wide off-target profiles. Again, for the gene targeted against EMX1, I'm showing you just the top off-target sites over here as it's cut off on the bottom. And so over here, I'm showing you the um, on-target site with the NGG pan, and these are ordered by CircleSeq read count. And you can see um, I've highlighted mismatches with respect to the intended target site um, over here. On the right, this is a so-called Manhattan plot where I'm showing you CircleSeq read counts on the y-axis and the genome-wide distribution of off-targets um, ordered by chromosome on the x-axis. And so here you can see the actual on-target site of the nucleus as well as many other potential sites of off-target activity. So we we're glad to find when we did comparisons between CircleSeq and GuideSeq that CircleSeq, uh, for most target sites, detects either all or nearly all sites previously detected by GuideSeq. So here I'm showing you Venn diagrams comparing CircleSeq to GuideSeq, where CircleSeq is labeled in blue and Gui uh, GuideSeq is in clear circles. So you can see that the overlap is nearly complete. There are a few sites which we didn't detect formally by CircleSeq, but when we look in the raw data, we do have reads at that, those locations, and so we think those are simply undersampled sites. So I think one important question at this stage is, what about these sites that are detected exclusively by CircleSeq? So do these represent bona fide sites of nucleus activity in cells? Are these potentially an in vitro artifact? Um, what, what are they? And so to answer this question, we um, used a method Called, that we developed called targeted tag sequencing. And so I think one of the challenges is that when we're thinking about the sites that are detected exclusively by CircleSeq, we really expect these to be low frequency sites. Since we've already analyzed these sites by GuideSeq, we expect that GuideSeq will capture the top 99% or more of off targets. And so we really needed a more sensitive method. The challenge with modern next generation sequencing is that the error rates are typically on the order of 0.1%, which means that it's basically uh, impossible to detect sites that are below this floor, this error rate. So to get around this, we uh, basically use uh, tag sequencing with the idea that we treat cells with both nuclease and the GuideSeq DSODN tag. Unlike in GuideSeq where we're using the tag as a primer for amplification, now we're just amplifying around the sites that we've detected in CircleSeq, and we're now really just looking for the presence or absence of the tag. And so Tag integration is really unambiguous evidence of double-stranded break repair because you have the tag um, caught between uh, your cleavage site. And so we use this as a proxy for mutagenesis frequency. And what's nice is that the background of tag integration is exceedingly low. We basically just don't observe it. Um, so in most cases, you can basically, uh, you have very clean background. And so here I'm showing you some targeted tag sequencing experiments. On the top, I'm, we're looking at some positive control sites that are detected by both GuideSeq um, and CircleSeq. So we can we obviously detect uh, those with high frequencies between uh, 0.1 and um, 100%. And here are some of the sites we looked at for CircleSeq. And so we can see that in this between 0.001, I apologize, it's a bit small, in this 0 0.001 to 0.1 frequency range, we can detect a number of uh, new sites, bona fide new sites that have been detected by CircleSeq. And so we can confirm about 25% of uh, the sites that we examined by, that are detected exclusively by CircleSeq. And so here's just another um, example that we looked at which, where we had pretty similar results. Finally, um, one other question we wanted to know is whether or not CircleSeq could detect differences in off-target uh, cleavage activity between different cell lines. And so here we performed CircleSeq on a number of um, different targets uh, between different cell lines. We had eight different targets. I'm just showing you one of those here. And so you can see that the correlations are generally pretty good, but that there are examples um, that kind of fall off this main line. And so when we look at these more carefully, for example, this red dot, we can find that they do actually correspond to SNPs um, in the genomes of those cells. And so you can see that 
the target that's more closely matched um, has high circle seek read counts, and the one that's less has orders of magnitude lower read counts. And so we think that this is just relevant to being able to detect patient-specific off-target sites in the future. Okay, so I think some take-home messages of my talk are that to evaluate gene editing safety, we really think that it's critical to define even low frequency off-target sites as comprehensively as possible. We think that this is important um, even if we don't necessarily know the function of all of these sequences because it enables you to monitor these potentially over time for clonal expansion, which is something that's been done a lot in the gene therapy field but would be ch more challenging to do for gene, for gene editing. That I've shown you data that CircleSeq is a novel, highly sensitive in vitro method to selectively sequence Cas9 cleaved genomic DNA. That we can detect for most target sites, we can detect all or nearly all sites detected by GuideSeq as well as many additional bona fide low frequency sites. And I'll note that we recently just published this in Nature Methods, so the protocol and software are available online. I think one comment I want to make on off targets overall is that I think that you can kind of take either a glass a half empty or a glass half full approach to off targets. And so I think that sometimes people hear this talk and they go, this is like a huge problem with off targets. And I just want to say that, you know, I am very optimistic about the potential for gene editing for therapy. I think that these sensitive methods for off targets really shouldn't be, um, shouldn't scare people away from doing gene editing. I think it's more important to have, take a basically open-eyed view um, towards gene editing off targets. So these are really methods for assessing risk. You don't really necessarily expect that editing nucleases will have perfect specificity, but in many cases you might be able to improve them to the point where you can't detect their specificity in cells. And so I think these are methods that might help you choose the most precise and safe targets uh, for gene editing. So some future directions that we're thinking of with CircleSeq, um, I think it has obvious application for um, looking at off targets in therapeutically relevant cells. So we're thinking about looking at this and looking at uh, doing experiments in uh, CD34 positive hemat hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells um, from donors. So another major challenge is we're thinking about improving methods for quantifying low frequency mutations. I think this is still a major challenge. I've shown you some data where we're using targeted tag sequencing to overcome this limitation, but we're doing this in a cancer cell line. And so in cells where you can't efficiently introduce these short tags, you still really don't have a good way of getting below this 0.1%. And then finally, you know, we're thinking about complementary functional assays really to evaluate clonal dominance to really get at some uh, of the functional effects of some of these off-targets to sort out which ones are important, which ones are not. Okay, um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge the members of my new lab. Um, my postdoctoral mentor, Keith Zheng, where um, this work, a lot of this work was done. I owe a lot of thanks to Keith, um, as well as our collaborators in uh, the ARIA lab who helped us with the bioinformatics. Uh, with that, thanks very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. that's detected by GuideSeq, mm -hmm. but there are more off targets uh, 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 detected by CircleSeq, but there's also like real off targets like validated. So what's the relationship between the three, like how many percentage of the real off targets are missed by GuideSeq usually, and then how many, what's the percentage of the off targets detected by CircleSeq are actually, you know, the real target, off targets? Right, so I think I can tell you based on what we know right now, so based on that targeted tag sequencing. So I think that was a slide where I think we were showing about a quarter. So GuideSeq um, detects a lot of the off targets in the high frequency range. Once you exclude targets that have been already detected by GuideSeq, um, out of the new sites we analyzed, we found about a quarter that we could validate by targeted tag sequencing. The ones we were not able to validate by this method, I think it's still unclear whether or not it's, those are not cleaved due to chromatin effects, uh, they might be in vitro artifacts, or that we simply can't detect them using the methods that we have right now. Thank you. Sure. It, it's nice that you can actually now test patients before doing the treatment, but I'm curious, <laughs> if you try half a dozen different cell types, cell lines, do you get different rates of uh, cutting? 
So if you went into, you, know, you use hex cells, or you went into uh, hemophytic stem cells, or you went into mouse zygote, would you detect different rates of off-cutting, or is it the same off-target? The same off-target activity? Um, so we, we've, I think it, probably a lot of it depends on the actual on-target activity, which will vary a lot between your delivery methods into different cell types. So I think that will be one major difference. And then I think um, between cell types, I think we don't have a large enough set of experiments to generalize whether you see drastically different off-targets, but I think the expectation is that we'd see in, in some cases basically high off-targets in one cell type and lower in another. So there's a good chance my mouse zygote is going to be okay. <laughs> Thank yes. you. <laughs> sure. Just, one, just wondering about, sorry, the control, uh, control experiment. Did, did you ever use any of these methods to test uh, the cutting by Cas9 in the absence of a guide RNA? Yes. So uh, for both GuideSeq and CircleSeq, we performed experiments with just Cas9 <laughs> nuclease alone. And so um, to the extent that we're able to look, we haven't really found um, Cas9 nuclease induced double stranded breaks that are convincingly caused by Cas9 by itself. That's not to exclude the possibility that there might be some, but using these methods, we haven't really found convincing evidence of that. Is that in vitro or also in cells? Uh, both in cells by GuideSeq and in vitro. And I think that might be because, uh, so based on kind of uh, confirmational work from, structural work from Jennifer Doudna, that in the absence of the guide, it's in an inactive form. So um, I have one question in terms of, sorry. Um, Obviously, in doing a lot of these uh, mapping off off-target sites in vitro, you know, one thing that, that's different is uh, the DNA is no longer, I guess, packaged as chromatin. That might have an impact on accessibility of nucleases to actually bind and, and, and cleave a particular potential off-target site. Uh, is there anything you can comment on that, or is there anything that you try and do to, to try and maintain some sort of chromatin architecture in your, in your uh, system? Um, so to answer that, so we have thought about that a bit. And so in our, um, in our analysis, we do, in our paper, we do an, a preliminary analysis looking um, at DNAs1 hypersensitivity in the sites that we have compared against GuideSeq off-targets and CircleSeq off-targets. Off um, and so we found this in our initial GuideSeq paper, too, that there is a slight association um, with increased off-target activity at DNAs1 hypersensitivity sites, but um, we don't have a lot of data on that, I think that um, if you're able to do uh, larger scale experiments, get larger set of cell-based off-targets, we'll really be able to start tackling that question. Right now, the um, cell-based off-target data we have is still fairly limited. Just a quick question regarding um, the GuideSeq protocol. Um, I'm pretty familiar, familiar with the uh, molecular methods in terms of amplification of the uh, D DSODN, mm -hmm. but um, how do you detect any mispriming events that you might get from the cell uh, DNA? Oh yeah, so um, when we run the protocol, we basically um, include a DSODN only control, and so then we basically exclude any sites that have been amplified in that control. And so that includes maybe any sort of mispriming mm -hmm. events as well as background to double strand breaks. Gotcha. So there's no, um, say, sequence tag on your DSODN that you can actually distinguish the incorporation of the DSODN in a cell sample directly on the DNA read. Yes, uh, that's a good idea. The tag is actually fairly short, and yeah. so there's not enough sequence um, to do that in, so in, in, the, in the current configuration. Another question I had was, did you run a number of experiments to test the um, efficiency of incorporation and the size of the DSODN? Uh, I was interested in the range or the flexibility of the DSODN and how you could adjust its size for oh, uh, affecting incorporation efficiency. And the size for incorporation. We have done some, ex uh, some experiments on that. I think that as you get to larger sizes, you get lower incorp uh, incorporation sure. efficiencies. Uh, okay. But I think you might be able to adjust it maybe to uh, get a little bit more sequence so that you can sure. distinguish bona fide integrations. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, we have a couple minutes. I'll ask another question. So I think it's a little some level a little bewildering to all the people who don't think about this all the time about how to deal with the off-targets. You make some recommendations about people who are using nucleases in different ways, so for example those who are using it for research applications versus those who are thinking about using it as a therapeutic, the ways that they might think about approaching this. Yes, absolutely. It's a great question, Keith. Um, so, so I think that um, it's really, it is important to disting distinguish between research and therapeutic applications. And so I think I would advocate that 
use the simplest methods uh, for figuring out off targets. And so I think in a research context, let's say you're able to use more than one guide to target a gene and you're looking for the functional relevance of that particular gene, I think that's probably one of the best strategies. Um, you might also do some sort of knockout and rescue experiments. So for research applications, I think there are more options. For therapeutic applications, I think that's the context in which you really want to define off targets as comprehensively as possible using genome scale methods like GuideSeq and CircleSeq. And in terms of the choice between GuideSeq and CircleSeq? Oh. <laughs> and then in between um, those two, I, I think that really you know, is the difference between a cell-based method and an in vitro method. And so uh, where you can perform GuideSeq, I think it's useful to get the top uh, list of sites. I think um, if you want to be as comprehensive as possible, you choose in vitro methods like CircleSeq or if you're in sensitive cells like CD34 positive um, stem cells. Okay, great. Thank you, Shandar. Thanks. Good morning and thank you. Um, so this is my disclosure slide. I'm an employee of Editas Medicine. Okay, so um, today I'm going to discuss, as, um, as they mentioned, um, how we think about creating CRISPR medicines for the treatment of hemoglobinopathies. As an employee of Editas Medicine, we are a CRISPR company, and so this is a really a big area of focus for us. And so when we start to think about this, the goal of our project right now is to modulate healthy fetal hemoglobin production through a gene editing strategy by targeting hematopoietic stem cells. But when you think about it, hematopoietic stem cells are exquisitely sensitive to perturbations in their environment. And what this means is that you have to be very careful in how you select your CRISPR tools from the toolbox, how you identify and select the target sites. We will get maximal or effective gene editing, but also maintain the potency of the cell so that the cells provide a lifelong therapy. And I hope to answer these questions for you today. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about is how we've developed a high throughput screen in adult hematopoietic stem cells to identify potential target sites for fetal hemoglobin induction at the beta globin locus. Now this is really important because it allows us to directly correlate a functional effect that is fetal hemoglobin production with our edit at an early stage of development. I'm also going to show you some data in which we're able to effectively edit the beta globin, globin locus for potent induction of fetal hemoglobin in adult hematopoietic stem cells. And then finally, I'll show you some in vivo data in which we achieve a repopulation of the blood system after treatment with these CRISPR nucleases. Essentially, we believe that the edited HSC platform has the potential to provide a durable therapy for the treatment of hemoglobinopathies. Now, before I get into the details, I want to just remind you about sickle cell disease, beta globin gene regulation, and then how we apply that to our editing strategy because a basic understanding of all these components is actually essential to how we, we think about creating a CRISPR medicine. Then I'll discuss our platform, that is the tools we have in our, available to us to really tailor and identify the best CRISPR tools for this program and for hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, I'll share some data on how we are achieving potent HBF uh, protein production in hematopoietic stem cells in the sugar population. So as a reminder, you're all aware, but let me just uh, remind you that sickle cell disease is caused by a mutation in the beta globin gene, or HBB, and this single point mutation has a very profound effect on the protein. At the amino acids level, um, there's a change from a glutamic acid to valine, and as you know, hemoglobin is a tetramer of two alpha globin units and two beta-like globin units. And so under low oxygen conditions, the sickle globin forms aggregates in the red blood cells, leading to uh, conformational changes in the, in the cell that cause it to become sickled and sticky, and what it, it, it basically uh, sticks to the vessel walls, causing vasal occlusion. And this leads to um, oxygen deprivation in the tissues um, call, that relate to uh, cause very extreme pain crises that can lead to uh, extended hospital stays and uh, very severe symptoms, including acute chest syndrome and stroke and embolism. And so as you can imagine, the single mutation has a very profound effect on the patient uh, mor morbidity and mortality and the general lifespan. And currently the standard of care is really to treat the symptoms. Um, and so really we think genetic can intervene here and create a, a lifelong durable therapy. 
So you've seen this before uh, in the previous talks, but let me remind you about how, 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 why we think that we can do this and how the globin genes are regulated. So this is a, from a schematic taken from a review from Canva and Orkin, which shows the globin synthesis um, over the course of development. And essentially, in utero in the fetus, the predominant beta-like globin gene that forms hemoglobin is gamma globin. However, shortly after birth, about four to five months, um, there, there's a switch in globin expression where the gamma globin gene becomes silenced and then beta globin gene is activated and that becomes a predominant form of hemoglobin. And this is, con this is concurrent with the onset of sickle cell disease symptoms. And at the bottom, I'm showing you the organization of the beta-like globin gene locus in which the organization of the genes mirrors the temporal expression from right to left. So, so how, how are the genes regulated um, how, at this locus? And um, suffice it to say, it's a very complex process, but I'm going to try and provide a very simplified overview. And for, for those of you globin experts in the room, I apologize if I'm missing some of the key details. Um, and so basically, uh, in the beta globin locus, there's a strong distal enhancer called the locus control region. And it's thought that through chromatin looping that this locus control region interacts with the proximal promoters of the different beta-like globin genes. And so in the fetus, this means that um, the LCR engages with the gamma-like globin genes to produce fetal hemoglobin. And in the adult, this means that the, uh, the LCR interacts with the beta, beta HBB or beta, beta globin to produce adult. And obviously the process is far more complex than this. I'm trying to show a very simplified schematic um, of this, but on the left you can see uh, the chromatin looping for gamma globin gene expression, and there are a number of transcription factors involved in complexes that then engage the proximal gamma globin promoters with the locus control region. And on conversely, on the right, on the right what you can see is that there's uh, several known transcriptional repressors of, of gamma globin. I'm only showing a couple here, b 11 a and SOC6, which interact with negative re regulatory motifs in intergenic regions, in locus control region, and elsewhere in the genome to actively suppress beta globin expression. And so why do we think that um, induction of fetal hemoglobin could have a potentially beneficial effect? Well, we turn to human genetics for our cues, and there are a number of inherited mutations in the beta globin locus, deletions and point mutations that when co-inherited with a hemoglobinopathy genotype, the patients have a, a high level of fetal hemoglobin, and in addition, they have a reduced disease severity and enhanced survival. And we can just look to the clinical data to see the effect of fetal hemoglobin. On the left, I'm showing um, a, some clinical data showing the uh, rate of acute chest syndrome in patients stratified by age plotted against the level of fetal hemoglobin, and you can see that the incidence of this severe condition decreases as the level of fetal hemoglobin is higher in the patients. And on the, on the right, what I'm showing you is the enhanced survival of patients that um, have a higher level of fetal hemoglobin. In this study, the patients were stratified based on their uh, percentage of fetal hemoglobin, either high, below or above 8.6%, and you can see in this Kaplan-Meier plot a, a, an enhanced survival advantage for the sickle cell patients that have higher fetal hemoglobin. So what's our gene editing strategy? Well, the goal really is to disrupt regulatory elements in the beta globin locus that repress fetal hemoglobin. And if you think about it, it's a rather complex process to make a medicine um, for this, to, for, for the lifelong uh, life of the patient. But essentially, the process of editing seems quite straightforward. You simply uh, remove the, or take out the um, 34 positive cells from the bone marrow or mobilized peripheral blood. And we use 34 as a marker to indicate hematopoietic stem cells, but essentially it's a much more complex heterogeneous population. I'll get into the implications of that later. But we isolate the cells from the marrow or mobilized peripheral blood. They're exposed to Cas9 ribonucleoprotein complex particles containing our, our target, uh, target and guide RNA of interest. And then these cells are then reinfused into the patient, and then we monitor um, repopulation of the blood system with these edited cells. But how do we uh, select the tools from our, our CRISPR toolbox to target this specific effect, and, and what are the implications of that? How do we think about um, how these pieces may be manufactured and assembled for optimal use in hematopoietic stem cells? And so indulge me for a moment as I again show you the two-part system called CRISPR, CRISPR systems. I want to point out a couple features that, that, that I think are important. So at Editas, we have um, two CRISPR systems available to us, not only the Cas9, but we also have CPF1 system. And this, the differences between their structure actually provides a lot of advantages to us when we're thinking about being flexible at targeting sites in the genome that might be hard to access with traditional Cas9. 
And so the Cas9, as you know, is made of a two-part system. It's a protein, uh, which is essentially the hardware of the system that's able to bind to DNA and cut it very well. In addition, there's the guide RNA, and that's more like the software of the system that you can upgrade and change according to the target site that you want to hit. Now, within the guide RNA, there are two sequences. There's a spacer or targeting guide, and this is what really binds to the DNA and identifies the target site. And then in yellow, what's showing is a scaffold, and this, this attaches the guide RNA to the nuclease. And what you can see right away is there's a, there's a difference in the size of the guide RNA between Cas9 and CPF1, in which CPF1 is about half the size, and this can have implications for manufacturing. Now, in addition to that, that difference, there's a difference in the anchoring site, that is the protospacer adjacent motif, that really anchors the guide RNA to the, to the DNA. And, and, and in terms of the uh, cut site, is actually also different based on that PAM, in which for Cas9, the, 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 the nuclease will cut three nucleotides away from the PAM. But in the case of CPF1 variants, depending on the orthologue, it can create a, a cut 18 to 23 nucleotides away. And in fact, will leave a staggered overhang with a five prime, a five prime overhang um, in a staggered cut compared to a blunt cut of a wild type cast. So you can envision that if you're trying to target a site that's hard to access directly and cut right next to it, if you have your CPF1 that binds distal to that, you're now able to access that site through CPF1. So that's a lot of technical information about proteins and guides, but what does this really mean in terms of platform and what we can do in the genome? Well, if you just map the or plot the uh, number of potential sites that you could potentially edit um, with uh, Pyogenes Cas9, and then you start adding in the different variants such as uh, Aureus Cas9, the Nikes, the, the um, enhanced specificity variants, the high fidelity forms, and then you add to that your CPF1 um, species and variants. We are now able to ta target 10 times more uh, sites in the genome than is available with um, the commonly used Cas9. Now, commonly used Cas9 is actually very good for many research applications and possibly for therapeutic indications, but when you think about trying to target all disease genes, not all of them are really accessible by the same nuclease. And what this really translates to, if you think about that we have three billion haploid bases in the human genome, with our extended toolkit we recently calculated that now we can actually, ca we can actually target 2.9 billion of them. So that gives us a lot more flexibility in how we approach and think about developing a therapy um, in hematopoietic stem cells. But what about the components and how do, we, how do we think about their effect on hematopoietic stem cells? As I mentioned earlier, stem cells are very sensitive to perturbations in their environment. They have an innate immune system in the cell that senses things like foreign RNA and foreign protein. And so how do you really tailor and select those reagents to maximize editing and minimize the, t the toxicity and the viability uh, loss that can occur if you edit with, with the wrong reagent? And importantly, how do you think about manufacturing and processing these reagents to be the highest purity um, and quality and engineer them such that the hematopoietic stem cell does not negatively respond to them? So focusing for a moment on the guide RNA, the guide RNA is a critical piece of the CRISPR platform because it directs the nuclease to the target site. Now, we believe that synthesizing the guide RNA is, the, is more amenable to scaling um, for manufacturing and allows us to control the fidelity of the sequence and, as well as the purity of the product. So we know exactly what we're putting into hematopoietic stem cells. And if you, for a moment, if you think about how we synthesize guide RNA, synthesis occurs opposite to biology. It occurs three prime to five prime. So by the time you're synthesized at the five prime end of the, at the guide RNA of a long, a long sequence, you can have a higher rate of misincorporations and truncations that can lead to a heterogeneous mixture of guide RNAs that may have different off-target effects and also that you can maybe perhaps can't control for. So to, in order to address this issue, uh, in our collaboration with I2, we've developed a method of generating covalently coupled dual guide RNAs. And in this process, rather than synthesizing a, 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 sing, a, a 100 mer guide RNA, we, we synthesize the guides in two parts and include a covalent linker between the two and then link them. And our mass spectrometry analysis shows that when we compare head to head, the, um, the fidelity of the sequence and the, the, uh, the purity of the, of the sequence by mass spec, we see far fewer impur impurities in our dual guide RNAs compared to the single guide RNAs. Now, what does it mean in terms of sequence fidelity? Well, we've, been, we've developed an assay to look at sequence fidelity from RNA sequencing. And this is not an eye chart, so please don't look at the numbers, just look at the colors. Um, and basically what I'm showing you on the y-axis is the, uh, the length of bases that are either deleted or added 
to that sequence by misincorporation toward the phi prime end, mostly toward the phi prime end of the guide RNA. And I've highlighted the targeting sequence as well, which again is the business end of the molecule that we need to have maintain the fidelity of that sequence. And you can see right away um, if the, the shading of red corresponds to the uh, level of misincorporation um, and fidelity sequence. So you can see comparing the single guides to the dual co covalently coupled guide RNAs that there is a higher sequence fidelity throughout the molecule and at the five prime end using our covalently coupled dual guide RNA approach. So in addition to how we think about what tools to assemble for use in hematopoietic stem cells, specificity is also important, and Shindar did a really nice job of kind of giving you the background and explaining all the cutting edge tools that they're using to address these issues. And as Shendar mentioned, it's very important when you think about a, developing a therapy that you have um, the most unbiased tools available to really identify any potential off targets because you can always discard those guide RNAs and find other guide RNAs it, it provided that you identify the off targets. So how do we think about off target analysis and specificity? Well, first we start with a proprietary in silico prediction method that predicts all the cutting sites for the target. And then we um, discard the guide RNAs that um, target elsewhere in the genome. And then with that, we move the, the remainder of the guides move forward to on-target cutting assays in hematopoietic stem cells, uh, the type of interest in this, of this talk. And then after that, we, because computational methods are not really enough to um, predict the off-target activity, we then performed empirical uh, cell-based methods that are unbiased to detect off-target cuts not only at sites homologous to the target site, but also sites that are non-homologous to the target site to try to form a comprehensive picture of the off-target profile for each, each guide RNA of interest. We then take the information from our biased and our unbiased screens, and we perform targeted assays in the uh, relevant cell type of interest in the case of hematopoietic stem cells. So now I've told you the tools we have available. So what kind of, how do we apply this to hematopoietic stem cells? And I hope to show you that, um, you know, we were able to actually tailor the system to work quite well in HSCs and that the cells are able to maintain their population potential. So in terms of the editing to induce fetal hemoglobin induction, um, first we start with an in silico predict prediction um, method to determine the potential guide RNAs that hit sites across the beta globin locus. And then, then we perform a high-throughput screening rather than in a cell type. We do it directly in adult hematopoietic stem cells. And we do this by scaling down the process and, um, and, and using um, RNPs that are made from uh, protein and synthetic guide RNAs. And by doing this screen at a low-dose RNP, this allows us to identify potential targets that have a higher potency than if you were to use a higher concentration or you were to screen them in a different cell type like K562 cells. And so basically after we edit the hematopoietic stem cells, we then perform urethroid differentiation assays, again, uh, high throughput. And then we draw a correlation between the level of fetal hemoglobin protein determined by HPLC or UPLC analysis to the percentage of editing that we see. And what I'm showing here is, a, is, a, is a how we select our hits. Uh, we, select, we select guides that have a potent, uh, a potent editing relationship between the fetal hemoglobin protein and the editing, and you can see those are on the left quadrant of the graph. Now, how did I come up with this number, and how do we benchmark our guide RNAs? Well, we looked to the literature for successful examples of gene editing for targeting uh, induction of fetal hemoglobin, and one such, such example is targeting the BCL11A urethroid enhancer with zinc finger nucleases. And what I'm showing here is on the left graph is a dose response in hematopoietic stem cells in which zinc finger nuclease mRNA targeting the b a urethroid enhancer is, um, is plotted against a percentage of editing detected in those cells. And what you can see is that the authors were able to achieve a very high level of editing um, at this site. And then on the right is the functional effect of that. That is the percentage of fetal hemoglobin induction that occurred after editing the hematopoietic stem cells. And so how do we, we, we take this data and then we try to estimate the correlation between the HBF and the editing levels seen in this work to provide a benchmark for our, our projects. And we calculated that the um, HBF to edit ratio is one to four. And so we set that as a baseline that we would, we would like to, to achieve uh, more potent edits um, than a one to four ratio of HBF to edit. So what does the results of our screen look like? Well, I'm showing some of the results here in terms of our top six screens that we, in, in, in top six hits that we achieved in an initial screen. 
And each color dot represents a different target. And what you can see is that we do have, do have indeed identified guides that support a more potent relationship between fetal hemoglobin, protein production, and the editing level. Now when we focus just on HIT-1, we then perform a very, very conservative low-dose RMP response. The rationale for that is that we're confident that if we can boost the editing to a meaningful level at a low dose of RMP, and there's a linear relationship between the editing frequency and the fetal hemoglobin induction, increasing the level of fetal hemoglobin protein even further is actually quite simple in our dose response. And what I'm showing here are the results from two different hematopoietic stem cell donors, which each color represents a different concentration of RMP. And what you can see is that our, our HBF to edit ratio is actually one to two for this particular hit, which suggests a higher level of potency. And in fact, we're able to achieve 25% fetal hemoglobin protein induction in the erythroid progeny of these adult stem cells. So now I've shown you that we can edit cells effectively. We can use a screening method to identify potent targets at the beta globin locus to induce fetal hemoglobin production. But the question, the real question is, 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 is do we alter hematopoietic stem cell functionality? Do these cells engraft and repopulate blood long term? This is a critical piece of, of the equation for developing a lifelong therapeutic. So taking you back to what I showed you earlier in terms of the hematopoietic stem cell and blood differentiation ontogeny, I have to remind you that uh, when we perform transplant test studies, we, the, we isolate the cells based on their expression of a cell surface antigen called CD34. And those are the cells that we deliver the RMP to, or lentivirus vector in the case of gene therapy. And although we use the terms interchangeably, 34 and HSC, they're really not the same thing in that the true hematopoietic stem cell that, produces, that is able to self-renew and produce blood for the life of the patient is actually a very small fraction of that population. So if you take your editing frequency that's based on your bulk population of 34 positive cells, you could be really underestimating, I mean overestimating, or um, getting a different result on the level of editing that you, than you actually achieve in your long-term stem cells. And the only way to look at the editing frequency and the functional effect of the long-term stem cell is to do a stem cell transplantation. And for that, we use the immunodeficient mouse model as a surrogate. And so in this experiment, uh, this is just showing a schematic of our in vivo studies. We thaw human CD34 positive cells, uh, adult mobilized peripheral blood CD34 positive cells. They're pre-stimulated with cytokines for a couple of days. We electroporate the cells with RMPs, targeting the beta globin locus for fetal hemoglobin induction, cryopreserve the cells, thaw them and at a later time point, and then allow this, the HSC to then uh, produce, to engraft, lodge in the marrow, and produce all the blood lineages. And then we sample the, um, the level the human cell reconstitution, the level of editing that we see in those cells in vivo, and then also look for the HBF produced by the 34 positive cells that are recovered from the bone marrow after transplantation. So what does the engraftment look like? Um, what I'm showing you here is one representative study um, for, for our program in which we transplanted mice with adult 34 positive cells that were treated with two different RNPs or donor matched untreated control cells. And in the bone marrow, what you can see here is we have a very high level of chimerism and very, very low variability between groups and between animals with no significant difference um, on the engraftment frequency between the RNP treated and the untreated controls. And importantly, when we look within that CD45 positive population in the marrow, what you can see is we have multi-lineage reconstitution. We detect B cells, T cells, and myeloid cells. And in addition to that, we have achieved 11% on average human CD34 engraftment in the bone marrow with no difference between the groups, suggesting that, we have, we have, that the, the RNP-treated cells can support long-term hematopoiesis and engraftment in vivo. And just to show a representative fluid cytometry plots that show the chimerism, uh, that is the level of human, it's 45 cells detected on the left um, compared to the, the mouse cells. And then if you look on the right, we see the total human CD34 content in the marrow, which again is quite high. So I've showed you that these cells engraft and maintain their multipotency. <clears throat> but what about, their, what about the agency diversity? Is that maintained after you edit the cells and transplant them in? And so the, one of the key safety issues, as Shendar alluded to from a different perspective, is how do we, we preserve the HSC pool? Uh, you know, we, like others, want to be sensitive to the fact that you have to make sure that the, you have a pool of hematopoietic stem cells that engraft and, and maintain blood for the life of the patient. We certainly don't want to see any kind of unintended consequences in terms of uh, oligoclonality creating all the blood. 
And so how we do this um, is we use the indole diversity at the target site as a marker to look for HSC diversity and polyclonality. And so uh, Shender did a nice job of talking about this earlier, um, but with, in terms of gene therapy, you know, the process is well established now with many methods that are very effective in which because the lentiviral vectors will integrate into, into several different sites in the genome and possibly more than one site per cell, you have a unique uh, way to track um, all of the different HSC contributions to blood production based on the occurrence of unique, these unique sites and then the common integration sites detected across the lineages in the blood reflecting perhaps that these cells came from specific hematopoietic stem cells in the marrow. But for gene editing, there should, if you have a good guide RNA, there should only be one site um, that is modified. And so how do we, we take advantage of this, this feature of gene editing? Well, despite the fact that it's a single site that's edited, Keep in mind that unique alleles can be occurred during subtle differences in DNA repair mechanisms in hematopoietic stem cells. And so we can use these unique differences when we do DNA sequencing to uh, survey for DNA diver for HSC diversity and the differentiation potential of these cells. So returning for a moment to the double strand break, we always envision this as occurring um, and then the process of repair might be non-homologous end joining and we think of there being an insertion or a deletion. But in reality, the process is much more complex and you really have a variety of events that can occur in terms of the outcome of the repair. And in fact, this is based on the indole characteristics, that is the size and the number of, of bases that are inserted or deleted and the position relative to the cut site and within the amplicon. And so you can use this to really try to understand how, what the diversity of your stem cell pool is that's making the blood uh, from the edited cells. And so we hypothesize that the multiple unique edited alleles in the progeny will suggest HSC diversity is maintained. So to develop this method, we focus on data we have for the HBB locus. So this is just develop the model system um, so that we can actually develop the method. And what I'm showing you on the far left is just a general schematic that we, you know, when we, when we deliver a HBB targeting RNP to hematopoietic progenitor cells, within that population, you've edited a few, a handful of stem cells perhaps. Then those cells go on and engraft the, the mouse. And um, basically what I'm showing you is sequencing results on the left. I'm gonna walk you through this. So we plot the percent of edited alleles on the y-axis. On the uh, x-axis, I'm showing the pre-infusion product, that is the bulk 34 positive cells input into the mice. And then the human cell content retrieved from the peripheral blood, spleen, and marrow. And then the human lineages we further isolated based on their phenotype from the marrow. And the gray bars correspond to actually a pool of low contributing clones in which um, these, these alleles, it's not clones, part, pardon me, it's unique alleles, low contributing unique alleles that we detect um, in these tissues. And so that's the sum of that. And if you look across that as a measure of diversity, because there are many different alleles detected in this population, you can see that the majority of the reconstitution and in the pre-infusion product is made of unique alleles. So that suggests that HSC diversity is present during the editing process and then is maintained in addition, we also rank the top five most abundant, uh, abundant alleles detected in the pre-infusion product and then in individual mice. And what you can see, although there are, there are alleles that are detected across the different tissues in each mice, um, no single allele is represented at a frequency of greater than 15%. And in addition, the top five alleles detected in one mouse are not the same as the alleles detected in the, in the second mouse, which is, again, all suggestive of... Um, HSC diversity maintenance after editing and no dominant alleles detected. So with that, I hope that I convinced you today that we've developed a high throughput screening platform in hematopoietic stem cells to evaluate the potency of CRISPR nucleases and guide RNAs uh, in HSCs to target HBF induction. We've identified potent hits um, for HBF induction that support 25% fetal hemoglobin in your birthright progeny of healthy adult hematopoietic stem cells. And the edited cells will reconstitute hematopoiesis in vivo and in graft long term with greater than 50% chimerism. So we really believe that CRISPR edited HSCs for the treatment of hemoglobinopathies have the potential to provide a superior clinical benefit to patients. And so I'm here representing a much larger group at Editas, and I want to take a moment and thank them for all their contributions. It's very much a team effort and a collaborative project, and it's also a lot of fun to work there. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, so thank you for your attention. And if you're interested in learning more about what we have going on, we have several presentations um, and, um, and throughout the next couple of days. So please stop by and see us. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you.
Thanks, Jen. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Yeah. Hi, good. that was great. Um, regarding the last part of the presentation with the persistence of alleles, mm -hmm. um, as you know, um, there's a concern for homology-directed repair that th those alleles may not persist as well. Mm -hmm. And um, within non-homologous end joining, there's multiple uh, endogenous repair pathways. Do you see evidence that um, products of specific NHEJ repair uh, persist better and perhaps like microhomology repair mm -hmm. may be disfavored? Sure. That's a really good, that's an excellent question and a really good point and has been noted in the field, particularly in hematopoietic stem cells. So what Dan is referring to is that not, you know, NHEJ is canonical, NHEJ is the predominant repair mechanism. And so if you achieve an edit that is through a different mechanism, perhaps it won't persist. That's a good, an excellent question. So we are starting to look at single cell clones um, to, to ask that question. On a population level, the data are still ongoing as, as so. Hi, Hi. Uh, so a couple questions. First was just a technical. I was just curious, why would you freeze down your CD34 cells one more time? You thaw them, you mm -hmm. edit them, and you freeze them down before you inject mice. I was just curious why that was done. Sure. So uh, I mean, we 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 obtain the the cells frozen initially, from, or we, we sort on them for 34, and then we cryopreserve, right? And the reason we do, we do a three-step is because um, if we're doing a clinical protocol, in some cases it might require a three-step after editing to allow for a batch release of the cells to the next phase. So that would lower the viability a lot, two freezes on 34. So what numbers of CD34s are you injecting per mouse? Okay, sure. So in terms of viability, we don't see a loss in viability. In terms of, um, I'm not implying at all in any, that we would do f two freeze thaws clinically. I'm not predicting that. I'm saying in our study, we do two three freeze thaws for, for um, convenience. Um, and in terms of viability, we actually don't have a lot of viability issues when we freeze thaw the cells twice and we have potent engraftment. To answer your second question, we inject 1 million 34 positive cells per mouse. And uh, did you measure HPF expression in your mice at four months? So that's a good point. So uh, the mice do not, will not produce functional red blood cells into the periphery. Um, however, what we do do is we isolate the 34 positive cells from the bone marrow, and we perform differentiation assays, and those studies are actually ongoing right now. Okay. Yep. Beautiful stuff, lots to think about. Um, one question I had, you have a really, really powerful platform, you know, huge scale, mm -hmm. especially with the UPLC. Um, have you ever seen re-expression of globin genes from editing individual sites without differentiating, like in the CD34 positives? Is it possible to edit a site and get globin expression without even differentiating? So we, we have not looked at the globin expression at this time in 34 positive cells, but those are in process as well. It, it just seems like, um, you know, the capabilities you have in this pipeline are something beyond the scale most of us could, mm -hmm. could get to. So it, it would let you ask a lot of really interesting questions about globin expression, basically what keeps it mm -hmm. off in HSCs versus on in differentiated cells. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you that we have several negative controls that where we didn't get fetal hemoglobin <laughs> expression when we edit. So at least that suggests that even if we edit cells at an orthogonal, a, a different locus, we don't see that effect. So I saw that you are keeping the cells three days in culture, namely they are cycling. And I was wondering what happened if you immediately, once you isolate them, engineer them, and maybe immediately transplant them into the animal, namely not letting them time to cycle in culture, how this is going to affect the NHEJ rates and the, uh, the preservers of uh, HSCs in the population of edited cells? Um, that's a really good question. We have done time courses to look at um, how much time to pre-stimulate before we edit and all of that. And we, you know, there might be slight, subtle differences in editing if you pre-stimulate for shorter periods of time. Um, but we don't see, um, you know, a significant impact on, on the overall, like, indel types that we, that we get when we change the protocol. And you don't have any concern that you're losing HSCs in the three days culture? We, so uh, lentiviral gene therapy trials have really, this really well established where you can pre-stimulate the cells for two days and then edit and modify them and a three-day pre-stimulation time seems to be acceptable from the literature. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's a great talk. I'm just curious what's the rationale behind using lentivirus versus other 
delivery method for therapeutic use. Okay, so why we would use gene editing instead of lentiviral? Or because we're using we're using gene editing. Right. So like uh, my understanding is that you're using lentivirus to deliver CRISPR. Oh no, I'm sorry. I, I should have no. We're using um, ribonucleic protein complexes. Oh, okay. So we make a. I did mention Lenti later to talk about the clonal tracking as a okay. reference point. So I'm sorry I wasn't clear about that. But no, we actually use protein. We use um, RNP that we complex, and we favor that because the it, it's a transient exposure to the editing machinery. Thank you yep. for clarification. Yeah, sure. Uh, can I ask really quickly, in terms of what the scale of delivery is with these experiments that you're doing, so using uh, RNP delivery, um, sorry, I, just in terms of what scale were the experiments done at, in terms of number of cells that you were uh, editing and then uh, in, injecting into the animals? Sure. Okay, so for the, um, for the, the screening studies, clearly we use 100,000, a couple, uh, you know, we use very low numbers. For the infusion, we do, we, we do anywhere from like four to six million. Okay. Mm -hmm. One more question. Yeah. For actually treating <coughs> uh, cystic, um, sickle cell anemia, mm -hmm. uh, since there's a lot of damage to the blood vessels of these patients from the sickle cells, mm -hmm. will you eventually have to get to a pure population of fetal persistence of hemoglobin cells to transplant into those patients? Mm -hmm. And how do you imagine sure. screening for those or sorting those? Sure. So, so the question is, um, how do we know that the indel or the edit that we're getting is going to support robust pancellular fetal hemoglobin production, correct? And how do we get to that question that we have multiple cells producing HPF? Is that well? Well, I guess my question was, how do you get the HPF cells as a pure population sure. to transplant into the patient? Since if you have background sickle cells, then mm -hmm. you would have a lot of the damage that the disease usually presents. That's a, that's a really good point. So uh, essentially what we do is we refine our editing technique to favor the uh, HBF favorable alleles, and we have several ways to do that and tools to do that. Um, and the other thing is, is a cr critical point that we haven't shown the data yet as the data are in process, is to try to understand the relationship between the percent fetal hemoglobin on a per editing basis, so on a clonal level. And so when we, when we have those data, that will allow us to then determine what indels are supportive of HBF and what are not, and then alter our CRISPR machinery or, or system to really favor the edit that will give us the desired effect. So, thank you. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Jen, again, for that wonderful talk.